and they had never seen anyone brown. And to tell you what I felt like is just the best described is I suddenly realized there was something wrong with me. And I guess to tell you the truth, I never knew that before. Wow. That's a tough one. Gabriella and I had an amazing conversation that lasted nearly two and a half hours. So we've had to do this podcast in two parts to be kind on your listening ears so you can actually absorb it all over a couple of days. But Gabriella's story is so inspiring, so motivating. And it's not just about what she went through when she was a little girl. It's the whole journey that she's been on to where she is today. And you are really definitely going to enjoy this story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Gabriella. How are you today? I'm great. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so delighted that you are on the podcast with me. And as a fellow Dutch person, and (laughs) let's talk about your surname for a second, because I know it as Von Rey. And because you are in the USA, you have to say Van Ray, correct? Yes, I do. As in I do. Ray- I, I say a ray of sunshine. Otherwise, they don't know what it is. Yeah, I know. Mm. I've had the same because my surname, of course, is De Groot. And mm-hmm. when we moved to London or to England, my father, who worked for the Bank of America, said to us, right, we're moving to England you're all going to have to change the way you pronounce your surname. We said, what? What's going on? He said, they can't say the ch in in England, right? So yeah. it was de Groot. So it was totally changed to something that was foreign. But now it's just de Groot and yeah. But I still have to spell it because people don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> it's funny because when an American here said your name, I honestly burst into laughter because I knew instantly it was the quote. Yes. But it took me a second to, <laughs> to get that. Yeah, brilliant. So surnames are really fun. They are fun and it makes us stand out a little bit. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. But when I hear them say Van Rigi, I don't oh. even turn my head because I, I, it's just not ingrained into my being. Oh, from Rigi. From Rigi. That's what I usually get. Oh, <laughs> that's really amazing. Um, <laughs> that's, that's classic. Yeah, because how does it even sound? They're trying to make a sound out of the letters, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, they really are. And and I always commend them for this incredible creativity. And I always feel sorry that I didn't turn my head because it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> oh, you know. wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story and your journey in life and business. So my first question I ask everybody is, um, please, can you share a little bit about or a lot, doesn't matter, about your personal life. So where were you born? Where did you move? Where were you educated? Um, and, and where you now live and where you've moved to? And, and so just to give everybody like a real good background about Gabriella and where she's come from. All right. <laughs> so my background is quite peculiar, I would say. Uh, I'm one of the first cross-cultural adoptions. So I was born at the foot of the Himalaya mountains in Pakistan. Mm. And uh, Pakistan had, of course, split from India at that moment. So I'm born in 1963. And I'm basically born also after the split. Um, no, no, I'm born before Um, after the split with India and before the split with East and West Pakistan. So I am officially born in West Pakistan (laughs) and the part that is attached to India. 
And um, I, my biological mother, at least this is what they think, Michael, dropped me at the orphanage. And the reason they think that is um, not only did she drop me at an orphanage, but she dropped me at a Catholic orphanage. And Mm. I think that is important for your listeners to understand because that's just not something you do because it's predominantly a Muslim country. But there are different religions. And of course, there are people that live there that are Hindi and Catholic. Mm. And many, many listeners wouldn't know that. So that's one thing that is special. And the other thing is that the nuns, and I have this crazy visual of these nuns with their white habit running behind this woman, asking her not to leave. (laughs) And because that's a little bit how they described it to me. Mm. They said the nuns saw this little package at the front door, basically, and looked around and saw this woman, you know, running away. And they went after her and they said, you know, um, we're not mad at you. We're not going to punish you. We're not going to do anything with you. But we ask you to give this child a birth date and a name. Mm. Now, the birth date, I understand the name. I don't because the next day I got baptized. So into a Catholic name, which is Gabriella. Wow. (laughs) And so my Pakistani names, and I'm probably going to massacrate this as much as people massacrate my last name, (laughs) is um, the first part is easy, Nassim, which is, uh, I would almost compare it to Mary. Yes. Or, you know, a very common Muslim name. And the second part is Akhtar. And and you need that kh that the Dutch have to do yes. that one. Yes. So I can do it. <laughs> and, um, and so they gave me Gabriella, and at least I have a birthday. So that's nice. And I know that sounds silly to people, but you know what? Um, of all the things I miss, I am glad that I have a birthday because it makes me more normal, right? Totally, yeah. It gives you a bit of identity, doesn't it, then? Yeah, it does because, yeah, I just feel like at least she gave me that. Yeah. And she gave me some names and and it, it just feels like she made the effort, you know? Yeah. And I can understand, you know, as an adult, I understand that all that is kind mm. of scary, especially in a Muslim country because... You know, we in the Western world have so much freedom that we sometimes forget that. So that's basically my first part of my journey. I spent three years in that orphanage. And just to go a little bit faster, there was uh, a lot of people don't know this. In Pakistan, Islamabad didn't exist yet, but they were building it. Mm. And while building Islamabad, they used an incredible amount of British people. And you'd think, wow, they got them out. How come they get them back? Mm. Right. Mm. And that's kind of my thought behind it. Like when I heard this, I went, didn't you guys fight really peacefully to get the English out? And then you asked them to come back and build. And I guess there weren't enough architects. And so this man named uh, Harvey Foster and his wife and his daughter lived in India and then got stationed by the British government in Pakistan to help build Islamabad because he was an a architect. Right. And as you can imagine, in 1966, um, this is fast forward three years, the, the wife... Uh, cannot find a job, of course, in Pakistan. So the only thing she can do is volunteer. Mm. And she volunteered in this orphanage where she met 50 children that, in her description, looked clean, but were very, very poor. So what she means by clean is we all had the same dresses on, we all had the same little shorts on, but she said we were very poor because we looked malnutritioned Mm. with big little tummies, you know? Yes. Um, And um, the food was just basically rice. And she said that we were very, very cold at night. And because what people don't understand, it's the north of Pakistan. So it's a little bit like a California climate, very warm in the afternoon. It heats up between 10 in, in the morning and four in the afternoon. And then the moment that sun goes down, it's really cold again. Mm. And so um, she tried to, 
get all the foreigners that lived in Pakistan to give blankets and to make little toys and things for the children in there. Yes. But what, what stood out for her is me. And I don't know. I can just tell you what I was told. I was told that I was very talkative. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> changed still- there. <laughs> no, no, no. I had my voice. <laughs> And I said in probably very pigeon English, I said, hey, lady, do you know where my family is? Because I'm waiting for them. And she basically thought I was slightly cuckoo. And and she said that with a big smile. She said, you know, I I kind of had a lump in my throat because here this kid is asking for parents and you were the only one. Everyone was shy except you. Yeah. And and she l- kind of pushed me away. And then I did it again the next day. And um, I was always trying to be near the gates, you know, trying to basically get the hell out of there. <laughs> mm. And And she told her husband about it. And she asked her husband to repair the leaking roof that was leaking into the bedrooms, the dormitory of the children. And, um, he said, don't, don't tell me who Gabriella is. I will find her all by myself. If she's this genuine talkative weirdo, I will find her. And apparently I did exactly the same with him. Right. And I said, Hey, mister. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. Hello, mister. Look at me down here. You know, a little bit like that. They said I was so little and basically I did the same spiel yeah. And they got interested because they said, you know, she was a psychologist and she realized mm. that if a child says this, there is some kind of painful history. And she said, no matter how sweet the nuns and how caring, they had no idea about psyches of children. Of course. And not. she said, I, I saw a lot of things that were wrong. They were kind of very harsh with you guys. And um, the harshness is just because 50 children is a lot to deal with. And any parent that's listening can understand that when you have four kids, it's already, you know, a big hassle at home. And it's, I guess it's a kind of discipline, discipline, you know, nuns, monks, they have to have discipline. So they were imposing discipline on the children, I guess. Mm -hmm. And she said that the little ones like me were tied up in their chairs a lot. And she said, yeah, she said it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't something mean. It was, uh, I mean, it's not by hand and feet or something, but she said there was, I mean, yeah, she said it wasn't like. A (laughs) seatbelt. Yeah. She said there was a belt around you that was attached to the crib and it was attached to the chairs. To stop them from running away, maybe. Yeah. They were a little bit scared that, you know, when they would walk away that these children might get, you know, fall or yeah, Yeah. damage themselves. And so, yeah, it sounds awful, but she said, knowing all this, I realized that if you were the only one talking about a family, there must be a reason behind it. And the reason behind it was that I had already been adopted and given back. And she digged enough. So my first act of kindness in my life is obviously the nuns, but I don't feel, if if I may say so, it was their business, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah, of uh, course. Uh, I, I know that that sounds maybe callous, but it was natural to them to take in children. And so for me, the real, real act of kindness, the first one in my life, except for the nuns, is Helen and Harvey, because they took an interest. They saw something that was out of out of the ordinary and decided to help this child. Yes. And they did so they they dug and they got to know that I had been adopted. And they also got to know that there was a family in Holland that was interested in adopting me. Right. And Helen said, well, did you tell them which child? And then they said, no, 
uh, not really. And then Helen basically said, we pushed for you because we realized that there is already something in your psyche that if you had stayed, you might not have, you know, been a robust, balanced child mm -hmm. because for some reason you needed more a family life than any of the other children. Gotcha. And so basically fast forward, uh, it was illegal back then. And now I can say that with the utmost security because the truth is everyone has passed away. Right. Except yeah. my, my adopted father, everyone has passed away. And I don't think they would throw anyone in jail that's over 89. So mm. I think we're safe here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and fast forward, I arrive in the Netherlands. And I need your help here, Michael, because the Netherlands in 1966, I hope that you know this better or maybe not because you might be actually younger than I am. How old but were you when you got there? I, I was three years old. Okay, well, I would have been seven. Okay, but you know, it was predominantly a Caucasian world in Holland. I mean, there was not a lot of diversity. No. Well, you say that. You're right, of course. My mother was Indian. Ah, and she Indian or Indonesian? No, Indian. Indian. Okay. India, India, not Indonesia. Yeah, I understand why you're saying Indonesia, of course. But no, she was Anglo-Indian married to a Dutchman. So she was very brave being there as well. Okay. But, so she must have gone through some things too about, yeah. while being there. Yeah, I'm sure. So the funny part is I didn't live in Holland. My parents lived in Luxembourg. So I just oh. arrived in Holland. And my father was in the Corps Diplomatique, so we, we lived in Luxembourg. Mm. It's a tiny uh, country that belongs to the Benelux, which is the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium. A little yes. bit of geography here. <laughs> and, and it's tiny. Most people don't know it. And they had never seen anyone brown. Right. And to tell you... What I felt like is just the best described is I suddenly realized there was something wrong with me. And I guess, to tell you the truth, I never knew that before. So just to give you a thought that comes to mind when I say this is children don't know. We don't see ourselves. You don't see Michael. I see Michael. I don't see Gabriella, you see Gabriella. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And so by saying that to you and your listeners, it's only through others that we can see ourselves. And in this case, I was incapable of seeing the beauty. And I was pushed at only seeing the bad side of who Gabriella is, unfortunately. So I associated Gabriella with something not good oh, wow. because of my skin color. Yes. And in the beginning, I didn't know what it all was, but it was, I had a lazy eye. I had, uh, my hair was shaved very short, probably for cleanliness purposes. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of, if I may say so, misfits mm. uh, on my physical end, right? And then on top of it, they hadn't listened to the letters of Helen and Harvey saying that I was tiny and my mother bought clothes for a three-year-old, even though she had been told to buy clothes for a two-year-old gotcha. and I'm still little four eleven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm tiny. And, um, but I'm not, uh, I'm still the right height for what is that called? Little people. I'm still three inches taller than the official little people. So I guess those inches make me feel proud somehow. <laughs> you're, not, you're not little or tiny. You're just far away. Yeah. And you know what? Like a gentleman said to me once, and this was an Indian man that came to my book reading, and he said, you're big from the inside. And That's I went, yeah. That's right. That's Completely correct. What a great yeah. saying that is. Yeah, I love it. He said, you're six feet tall from the inside. And I went, oh, I love this man. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. So, but Good fast job. forward into life. My parents are um, very strict, very Dutch, 
very, um, I would almost say Calvinistic. Uh, it's one, two, three, and please follow. And if you can't, you're going to be punished. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it, but I think it, it, for the type of inquisitive human being I am, I think it was very difficult for the type of child that I was. Mm. And I didn't make things any easier because I'm that kind of person that just says, why? Mm. <laughs> why do you punish me? What? You know, that kind. And, and you know, I'm that kind of child. Mm. And so it wasn't easy for them by any means. And um, so I would honestly say it wasn't a very happy adoption on both sides. Right. And, and I don't think my parents knew what what they got into and then when they got into it it was more than they could chew basically because here you have this child that's already molded you know and you're trying to remold them and i just give you one example because i think by giving you this example it will set the path for my business yes um so my name is gabriella and they tried to call me ellen which is a very nice, wholesome Dutch name. Yes, Ellen, and, without an H. Yeah, without an H, Ellen, E-L-L-E-N. Yeah. E -L -L -E -N. That's it, And yeah. um, I guess if you look at this from my standpoint, I have no idea who Ellen is. I don't speak Dutch. I speak a little bit of English and a lot of Urdu. Mm. And so you can imagine the conversation between the family and myself was tiny mm. and, um, and, and people need to understand that. So I pointed to myself and I said, shaking my head, Gabriella, as if they're dumb, right? Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I have to laugh, Michael, because I don't think that's what you do with parents. I don't think you have this kind of condescending little look in your eyes and tone and say, poor people, I'm Gabriella. You've got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're silly. You've got it wrong. <laughs> and I think if you did that today with the Dutch, they would all be laughing. Yes. But we, we just live in a different generation today where totally. this is possible and this was not possible. You didn't talk back to the elders. No and way. And here you got this little squiggly thing that's, you know, talking back and not following rules. And I'm like, you know, I'm adamant. There's no way in hell they're going to call me Ellen. Mm. And I think it was my innate dignity that said, you're not going to strip me of my last identity. And I, did it, I say, did it work? It did. Oh, it did. Brilliant. Because they tried. And my father, who is a little bit more flexible, said to my mom, I think this is quite some girl that you got here. She's not going to have it. Mm. You got, you got one personality on your hand here. And he said later to me, it endeared me to who you were. Yes. Because he realized only when I arrived at that airport in Amsterdam, what he had done. He, he told me later in my teenage years was very personal in your face conversation with emotions flying from person to person. And he said, when I saw you, I knew we did something that we shouldn't have done. But right. here you are, because we were incapable to understand you and incapable of giving you what you need. And if you had born into the family or if you had been a baby, then we mold you and we're used to that scenario. Yes. We're not yeah. used to the scenario. Here's a child that we're just going to help. Mm. We're we parents are, we have children that do what we say. And yes. that's the way we were brought up and that's the way we treated you, just like we treated our own children. But it worked better with them because we molded them. Mm. And he said that, you know, we, we forgot that you came from something and that you're scared. And we didn't calculate the fear 
that we on top of it brought. And then I want to say something really beautiful and just lovely and, and actually fun. Mm. And uh, I learned the language within a month. I spoke Dutch. Wow. And people say, wow, how? And I, I'll give you the secret. Mm. It's because I could say the huh. Um, oh, of course. Yes. The Pakistani language is derived from Arabic, just like Dutch is derived from Germanic mm. languages. Mm. So the base is Arabic. So if it's an Arabic base, we I hope that your listeners know that when we hear Arabic, we hear kh all the time. Correct, yeah. And the kh and khot and khut and uh, bad words, khotfredomme, <laughs> all those words are with that same kh. So that came so natural to me that I had no problem with the language. Right. Course. That's so really I learned it. Yeah, I learned it really fast. And I think that was really my savior to be I, so adaptable. Yeah. And did you change your pronunciation of your first name to Gabriela or no? No. Ga, Ga Gabriela. Always and I stayed Gabriela. And I must say, the reason my parents, I think, did Gabriela and not. Gabriel or Gabriel mm. is because both parents have this enormous passion and love for France and spoke fluently French. And so they, um, they kept the French way of saying my name, which is Gabriela. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's lucky then. That's yes. Wow. I, I love that they kept that. And I think the love for them for French kind of also connected us because what people don't know is that some of the nuns in Pakistan came from Belgium and Belgium, we speak Dutch and French, mm. actually Flemish and French. And so I learned all the French songs and it connected me to my folks because they heard me sing. And because they finally understood something that I was saying, they were very happy with that. Wow. So the French language brought us closer together. Even though I didn't understand what they were saying, they understood my songs and sang with me. Yeah. Yeah. So th that was our connection together. So that's <sighs> basically my life in a nutshell. And Maybe the easiest to describe it is I had no clue how to belong. Sure. And the first 15 years, no, uh, sorry, the first 12 years of my life with the Dutch family, so till the age of 15, but because I started at three, we got to deduct. So yes. the first 12 years of my life with them, I had no clue how to belong to them. I didn't know how to do it. I wasn't taught how to do it. And you keep standing out because you get bullied. And I was not this kind of kid that wanted to really, I told my dad once and realized he couldn't help me. And that I felt kind of bad to ask them for advice because it's not like, let's say if I may take you know, your family as an example, when you are an Indian family coming to the U.S. or coming to England, you are a tight knit group where all the children get bullied at school. Right. And then you come home and you can tell your parents because they know what it's like to have the color. Right. Mm. And I didn't have that. So I realized that I shouldn't come knocking on their door very early because how can you understand something that you can't understand? Totally. And it was a totally, you're right. It was a different era. I had the same, I had the same in the opposite way because I, because my father was Dutch and therefore white and my mother was Anglo Indian, but dark skinned were kind of the children ended up being kind of white, but tan really well, you know, so if we're in the sunshine, we go nice brown color, um, but people don't see us as a kind of 
Indian looking. Mm -hmm. But what happened was we, we went to live in Suriname for a while and for three years, Suriname. Yeah. And I went to school there and there were lots of black kids and, a, and some Asian kids as well. But we stood out, my sister and I stood out because we were the only two who went to school there. None of, I've got two other brothers who didn't come to Suriname. But we, we got bullied there because we were kind of white. And there were other white kids, but there was something about us that they, you know, so we got it the other way around, interestingly yeah. enough. And you're right, it is at that age and at that time, it's a shock to the system, but there's nothing you know, you don't know what to do. Literally mm -hmm. don't know what to do. So I completely kind of understand where you are with that. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no, there's no manual, is there? I mean, what your parents who adopted you did, there was no manual for them that said, this is how you have to treat an adopted child, let alone an adopted child from Pakistan who ended up in a, in a, you know, with nuns, uh, there's no handbook to teach people. I mean, no. there's no handbook how to bring up children. Well, people say there is, but there really isn't. Yeah. So, so they had a doubly hard, absolutely. They really did because there was no support for them in, in their many questions, I am sure. Mm. Um, and I love that you say that you experience that in those situations, you really don't know what to do. No. Um, because it's almost too embarrassing to tell someone and you don't want to hurt their feelings either by showing that you haven't integrated. Yes. And I think this is the part that children, no matter what they're bullied for, have the same problem. We think... I mean, I thought this, and I meet many children that think the same. It will go away, right? If I'm nice and I show what an amazing human being I am, they'll like me somehow, right? Yes, yes. And it's that crazy optimism of children. And we don't know, um, <clears throat> like the barometer, the thermometer between um, when to tell when enough is enough and where you can still handle it. Mm. And I think this is a, a, a huge problem for children. Uh, when is it enough and when should I tell because my livelihood is at stake? And I don't think we know that answer. And so um, I think I should have pulled at the alarm bell more often throughout the years than I ever did. But in hindsight, uh, the nice part is you can teach it now, right? That mm. children need to pull at the alarm bell immediately because there is an adult that can help them. In today's society, there's always someone. Yes, totally. There is somebody, yeah. Mm -hmm. But kids still don't know to ask, though. Uh, it's no. still a struggle for them. It's still a tr struggle for them. Yeah, it really is. But... That's why I do what I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, yeah. so okay. So you're in. Did you did you stay in Luxembourg? How old were you? No, when you, no. Uh, we moved immediately two years later to Brussels, the headquarters of the EU, mm. which didn't exist back then. It was called differently, but uh, Brussels. Uh, we moved around a lot, and maybe the only important thing left to say is. My parents divorced when I was nine and a half. And so the wow. family unit fell apart. And somehow I always felt that I was to blame for that. Of course. And, and of course I wasn't. But yeah, I heard, I heard aunts and uncles say it in the grapevine. And children have big ears, you know. Mm. And uh, they spoke French thinking you don't understand it, but which is crazy because we were taught French. So I don't know. I don't know why parents think you don't understand another language. Kids are way too smart. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, the family unit fell apart and um, it, it went kind of downhill from there. My father moved to Canada and I moved at nine and a half for the first time to the Netherlands, 
where I was bullied merciless. Mm. I think the I had a lot of bullying in Luxembourg and, and Brussels, but in comparison, the biggest bullying I ever had in my life was in Holland. Yeah. I mean, they were brutal. Wow. Brutal because I was polite. I had a Hague accent, which you can understand. You've heard my accent in Dutch. So they said it was too proper. And it sounded like I was stuck up because the classes in the Netherlands are a little bit like the cast in India. I compare it like that because right. by your accent, they know where you belong. And the reason I say this with confidence is because in 2010, I was interviewed during the Vancouver Olympics in Vancouver by a Dutch journalist who said within one second, I know who you are. And I went, excuse me? Mm. And he said, I see it by your, and I need to say this in Dutch and maybe you can help me out. Zegelring. Wow. It's, it's, yeah, it's those signet rings that... Signature ring, yeah. Yeah, it has the family crescent in it. Mm, mm. It's I, like a weapon. I've never heard of it, to be honest, but... Oh, okay. I, I mean, Zegelring. I left... No, no, I, I know what it is, what you mean okay. with it. What I mean is I've never heard anybody say that before, but I, uh, I did leave the Netherlands when I was, you know... Young. Well, I was 17, but uh, and I've been out of the Netherlands for, for about two and a half, three years. So I kind of left when I was 13, then came back for a year or two and then came to England. But um, so interesting that they have that same perception of people because the same happens in England, of course, mm -hmm. because there are many different accents in England, whether it's the South, London, or the Midlands, or the North, and then mm -hmm. there's and then Scotland. And yeah, people totally judge people based on the accent they've got. And it doesn't yeah. matter how successful you are, they they judge you and put you into a class system. Yep. Yeah, totally. And I had forgotten about it because I live in, I lived at that moment in Canada. And this man reminded me instantly mm. of this classes. And this is, I have a feeling this is a reason I live in North America. Mm. Because in North America, I don't know if that makes any sense, but you can disappear and mm. appear. Mm. And what I mean by disappear is I'm not talking about not being there. I'm talking about your surname is not important. You can disappear about the classes. You can disappear. You are you, and you have to prove who the heck Gabriella is. Yeah. And that's all they care about. Yeah. And nobody really is interested enough to find out where you come from. Mm. They don't care. And I know that sounds maybe sad. But as a teenager, I had, uh, I made this decision by 16 and a half. At 16 and a half, I decided that I was better off in North America being an unknown Gabriella than being a Gabriella with a caste stigma and then having to explain nonstop that you're adopted or yeah. this or that. So I ended up just I, I love that disappearing act of the family unit and that I could just be Gabriella. Mm. And how did you do that then? Did you just move from Canada and into the US? Yeah, I, I moved from Canada to the US and I became, of course, you cannot find a job when you're 15. So I am a high school dropout at 15 and a half. And, um, I'm not very proud of it. I'm a little bit embarrassed, but that's the way it went sure. because I was still that girl. Like I talked to Helen, I was this, you're not going to get me. Um, my parents said, you have to tow the line. And I said, you tow the line, you know, you don't do what you say or what you preach. I'm not going to do it either. Mm. And then they basically said that I was an idiot and dumb. And oh. that part I didn't like, I didn't like being called dumb. 
So I said, what can I do to prove to my dad that I'm not dumb? And my dad said, and, and I think my dad was dumb because he said, go for one trimester to boarding school in Boston and prove to me that you can be a grade A student. A grade A means that you're pretty good in all your classes. Yeah. And I got B's and A's except for math because my family really knows I can't do it. And so I got B's and A's and everything else. I proved that I was good. And I left the school after the trimester. Mm. Because to me, my deal was done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a kid, you know. I, I, I didn't think further than, yeah, than my height. <laughs> well, and, um, you, you took him, I mean, it's, it's a typical Dutch thing too, that is, because, you know, the Dutch are very direct and yeah. you were given a direct kind of challenge and you took the direct challenge on and you yeah. carried out the challenge and that was it. No one said then, carry on after that. <laughs> no. And so I really laughed. I told the principal, I'm out of here. And I packed my little suitcase, left half of it, and, and went to New York on the train. I had very little money. And who do you think I ended up on their doorstep? Helen and Harvey Foster. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it did came full circle. And I was a teenager. I need to really tell you this. <laughs> um, and again, um, I don't know if I'm sad or not sad about this behavior. I don't have any regret about it. I just said, here I am. And I just need to tell you that I think you made a huge mistake in meddling in my life. And they were like, whoa, <laughs> who is this girl? She's not nice. <laughs> Well, she hasn't changed. She speaks her yeah. mind. And I basically told them off. And uh, I smoked cigarettes, of course, which irritated them to no avail. Mm. And um, and I, I said, you know, you meddled. And I said, is there a crime in being poor? And I think that's when they started listening to me. Right. And they said, what are you talking about, Gareda? And I said, I have heard all my life to be grateful that they took me out of poverty. And so my answer back is, what's wrong with poverty? I'd rather be poor and live with my family and my culture and in my country with my mother tongue than wonder. And so they choked, I choked. And then they, they were really sad. And then um, Harvey was very, very smart. And he told me something and it stayed with me. So I thought he bestowed me a lot of kindness. And he looked at me and he said, now you take that sadness and you just get it out of you. Get it out. Rebel, do whatever you need to do, stand on the top of the World Trade Towers, which he actually took me to, and um, shout, give it a good cry, very British. And he said, now, dust yourself up and get up. And I did. Wow. And he said, you can't blame anyone. You got to live your life, kiddo. And if it's any consolation, I think you're going to be great at whatever you do. It's too bad that you have no schooling, but you know what, Gabriela? You might take the long route, but I promise you, you're going to get there. <laughs> That's what he said. And he said, with your voice, and of course, I took it wrong because I thought he meant that I had a loud, booming voice. <laughs> and he, he, he said, no, 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 Gabriela, your voice, you're eloquent. You, you do not sound uneducated. You're eloquent. You use your words correctly and you will stand up for what's right in the world and what's right for you. That's what I mean. Yeah. And I went, I didn't understand all of that, of course. Mm. And I said, okay. So I became an au pair girl in Washington, D.C. And uh, went back to high school uh, night classes 
And I did something that's called GED, General Education Diploma. It's an equivalence diploma. And then I went to nursing school. So I, I took a longer route, but I got where I wanted. So I think um, that's kind of how it all started for me. Wow. And, and nursing school, as in training to be a nurse? Training to be a nurse, but because school is expensive in the United States, um, maybe that was not smart that I chose the States on the expense part. Yes. So I could only become a nursing assistant. Right. And, um, but that gets you in the door. And then uh, I was told to do a whole year. And if you did the whole year, then that would be counted for your next diploma, you know, to go up and up and up in yes. the in the ranking, so to speak. And you didn't go to university back then to become a nurse. These were all day schools or evening schools. Yes. And my father had said to me at the age of 15, um, I think uh, you are made to be a nurse. And I didn't know what that meant. So I really did ask. And he said, you have the sunniest disposition of anyone I know. And if you walk into a, a room with an ill person, you will just brighten their room just by being there. Oh, that's and I kind of went, okay. And the funny part is I became a volunteer in hospitals from the age of 11. So I knew it well by the time. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, I had this knack of, you know, I would go into hospitals and read to the elderly or read to the sick, um, put flowers, you know, nothing fancy or anything. But and, and this is Dutch, by the way, just in case you wonder what this is. <laughs> it, this is my Dutch mother. In, I went with her to volunteer for the first time. I must have been nine and a half. So she instilled that in me and I loved it. Absolutely love volunteering. Mm. So she gave me something that I hold near and dear to my heart since that day. And every time I can do something, I'll do it. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, and it might not be daily, but it might be monthly, right? Sure. And you just spontaneously walk into a hospital and start helping. It's that easy, you know? Mm. So my, my, my jobs in between, though, I got jobs. And I know you want to hear a little bit about jobs. So I think yes, I can please. give you something that a person, believe it or not, my first boss gave me my biggest encouragement in life. Because I don't know his name anymore, but I was 16 and a half. And I had already done a year of um, um, nanny work and I wanted to do something else. So uh, I went to nursing school. Uh, sorry, I, I went to nursing school and like, you know, half nurse, half school in the evenings. And then I needed money. So I went to this job and I lied. I said that I could do this big computer thing, which I couldn't. <laughs> and it was this huge, huge machine. And, um, and he said, okay, he believed me. And I told him I was 18, which worked with a little bit of makeup and my hair in a bun. It worked. And, um, so I started the job and with, at the end of the day, he was going to fire me. And he said, oh my God, you lied. And I said with a huge grin, yes, I did. <laughs> and then I said, but I got my foot in the door and there must be something Pakistani in me after, after all, because I love wheeling and dealing. Yes. And so <laughs> this is not very Dutch, I think. And although the Dutch are good entrepreneurs, aren't they? Yeah, totally. Kopmanne, yeah. So I don't know where I got it from. Anyway, I think it's a mixture. You've you've been exposed to a mixture of both the the, the kind of the traders in those <laughs> nations. <laughs> yes, I, I love that. Thank you. Yes, that's it. And so I started negotiating, and he looks at me baffled. 
I mean, totally baffled. And he's a young guy. And he wanted me to do English Dutch translations, but to type it out on that machine. And I said, give me the whole weekend. And I promise you, I took the manuals. I took them, you know, I took that time. I said, just give me this time. And I did. And I barely slept, barely ate. I looked like a zombie on Monday morning, but I knew it. And he, I said, I'm here for my first task. And he gave it to me thinking I couldn't do it. And I did it. And I thanked him at the end of that Monday. I shook his hand. I almost shook his arm off. And I said, I thank you for giving me a chance and for letting me believe that I could be a good entrepreneur. Wow. And I said, it, it just gave me the basis. It's the first time I really believed that I could do something, you know, that I could really be smart and that no stigma, you know, those stigmas where, you know, you're an orphan. The stigma is, well, you're, you're brown. Another stigma is you're autistic or you're slow or you're, you know, all those stigmas. Yes. I suddenly, because of him, I felt I had no stigma. Wow, he took it incredible. away. Incredible. He, and I wish I knew this man's name because I would write about him, mm. but he's got to stay nameless because memory is funny, right? There are things you remember the faces and the feeling, but not the names. Yeah. 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 But, but he gave me my chance and I had a good work ethic from my parents and the combination with believing in me and his encouragement. I don't think I ever not undertaken something that people said, you can't do it. And I said, yes, I can. <laughs> Well, and because that, yeah, that's really fabulous because you'd proven to yourself that you could overcome anything, you know, that was such a challenge to overcome that. And you did it. You, hmm. you, you did believe in yourself. And I think this is part of it. You know, there's, there's the kind of people that are listening to this podcast are people that are in business or wanting to get into business on their own. But the trouble is they lack that belief in themselves half the time. That's why not more people are walking out of corporate jobs, starting their own business because they haven't got self-belief. They need that, you know, they need somebody else to tell them that they are good rather than believing in themselves. It's a massive thing in society, especially in the UK, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, America is a bit different. Totally agree. Okay, so... But, but I have advice here. I think uh, th my advice to anyone who's listening who wants to start on their own, the reason you don't believe in yourself is because we listen to our buddies. We listen to our friends. I, I make that mistake sometimes still today. Like, let's say that you have a kooky idea in your head mm. and, and you're so excited about it. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to run it by your friend. I know. And the friend says, no, that's crazy. So where does your business plan come from? Where, where's your funding? Um, where do you think you're going to be in six months? This is never going to happen. And he goes off, he or she goes off the list of a real entrepreneurship, right? In the yes. first year, you have to accomplish this, 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 this. And then you're so discouraged from them that you don't do it. So no. my advice, this is the best advice that I give my own self is when you have a brilliant idea, if you want it to stay brilliant, please don't tell anyone and just go out and do it and ask advice when you're stuck in the area you're stuck in. That's different, but don't give them that whole passionate spiel of your idea because it will be knocked down. And I think I figured out why, because if you go and move forward in your entrepreneurship, instead of your boring nine to five job, then he or she that's talking to you feels that they can't relate with you anymore because you moved 
on into a stratosphere sphere where they're not in and they're afraid to be left out. Yeah, I think that is part of it, definitely. And yeah. But, you know... It's not we, all of it, but it is part of it. The, the biggest thing, Gabriella, is that everyone has filters, right, that they mm -hmm. see the world through. So you see the world totally differently than I do. There may be some yeah. common lap over, you know, crossovers like, you know, kindness, happiness. We're both passionate about that. But um, a lot of people have filters uh, and been conditioned over a number of years, could be parents, could be teachers, mm -hmm. could be friends over the years, and beliefs that they have developed based on their thoughts. And yep. so when they hear something, they it goes through those filters and they then make a judgment based on that. And a lot of it is around fear. So fear of, it uh, could be fear of missing out. Oh, well, if you're going to do that, what about me? Then you're going to leave me type of thing. You know, you won't be my friend or my anymore. Uh, would be fear of, well, what if you don't succeed? If you don't succeed, you're going to be sad and I don't want you to be sad. Um, rather than having that encouragement that says, you can do whatever you want. Absolutely. What a great idea. Go for it. I'm here to support you. Um, and that should be the attitude, really, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's difficult, I think, because every other person that you talk to has their own set of fears and their own set of, like you say, uh, glasses that they look at life. Yes. So that's why I feel that it's too hard to share your idea because no matter how good friends they are, they don't have that passion that you do. Mm. So that's why I always say just do your idea or if you ask for help, do it differently and say, this is what I'm going to do and tell them that you're not seeking for advice on the plan, but more of the logistics of the plan and certain areas of the plan. Yes. And we do live in a technology world where we can find this information way more readily than in the old days, if I may say so. Um, you know, if, if, if you want to become really good at marketing, you have online courses today. If you want to become good at X, Y, and Z. It's it's just really interesting, right? Mm. That you can look that up. I mean, I I I take online classes all the time. I take Spanish. I I read articles. I'm always interested in everything that's out there that we can learn for free. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. You're totally right. I absolutely agree with you. And and I've got an example in my business today where I need to learn a new skill. And I found a 28 video course on YouTube that is going okay. to allow me to learn it and not cost me anything to learn it. May I ask what it is? No, it's a secret. <laughs> OK. No, OK. It's it's. It's one of those where people go, no, you're not going to be able to do it. <laughs> um, okay, but I won't say that, I promise. No, no, it's not, it's not that. It's, um, it's about a technology that I want to apply in my business so that my okay. product becomes uh, more interesting that I can deliver to my clients. And gotcha. So it's, it's like an additional feature, as it were. And uh, it's not a new idea as such. Uh, it's already being done, but I haven't got the skill to do it. So I've seen it being done and I went, right, I want to learn how to do that. So I went on a mission to do that. And literally yesterday was actually thanks to my wife, Claire. She found something which was inexpensive to purchase, the software. And now mm -hmm. I've just got to learn how to do it. And I've spent my first like two hours this morning learning the first step. Uh, on Super. that journey. Yeah, it's so exciting. I can't tell you. I think I think your passion will will guide you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I mean, last night I couldn't sleep because I was so excited about, nice. about learning a new skill, you know, yeah. and, and hoping to see the fruits of that learning coming through in my product. So, 
yeah, it's it, you're right. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it is so nice to learn. It it just keeps it keeps your. I always say you you say glasses, and I say it keeps those blinders that we have. We're like horses, you know. Mm. It it just. I always say the blinders. You can put them on wherever you want because you're in charge, right? Mm. And just the other person, like connecting with you gives me the opportunity or learning a skill gives me the opportunity to take those blinders off for that moment. And then you can safely put them back. But in that one moment, you take them off for a second and you've widened your horizon. Yes. And nobody can take that away from you. So the learning skill is just widening your horizon, just like new friendships are. Yes. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Okay, so where did the journey take you then, Gabriella? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay, the journey, believe it or not, took me back to Europe. And uh, I think there was something inside of me that was still very European. And I think I missed it. And due to an illness that I couldn't have foreseen, something about my tendons on both legs made me not be able to continue nursing, which right. you know was pretty sad. But again, I'm adaptable, so I need to think. So I arrived back at the age of 21 in Europe, and I got actually uh, found by a headhunter um, to work in technology because, remember, I, nothing phases me anymore, so I just learn it. When I don't know, I learn it, mm. period. Mm. That's the way I look at life. So I learned another skill within the te technology of computers and within entrepreneurship. And I started working for Olivetti as a freelance, yes. not as a, I've always liked the principle of freelancing because it teaches you skills, but it opens the world for you to say, ah, but I love this part or this part. And I remember very, very distinctly going to the Chamber of Commerce in Brussels and there was no uh, uh, little square to put my profession in. And um, because it just said, um, um, it said computer coder and I wasn't a computer coder. And nowadays, just that whole thing of technology, you have... 30 different things that you can fill in now. Yes. They're all there, right? Programmer yes. and then designer and then animator. And oh my God, there's so many that it, I don't even know them all. Yes. And so anyway, but that's what I did. And again, so I was encouraged by the people I worked in. They were kind enough to share with me what I could do and what I wasn't doing well. And I've always appreciated that kind of feedback. And I think that comes because you're a freelance. Yes. What do you think? I, I, I believe you get a little bit more feedback than if it's a day job. Well, people should give feedback in the day job, okay. but you're <laughs> right, they don't. I mean, if you're freelance, I guess, um, they need to give you feedback because they're paying for your services, aren't they? So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you could be right, actually, that people take suppliers more seriously than their own people sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and you get fired immediately, right? If, if I don't sure. deliver what I promise, then they go, hey, 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 I'm not, because it's an invoice, right? It's not paid yet. Mm. You do the service while... There is an invoice pending. It's a different work relationship. Yes. So I have learned in my life one thing very early with that first job. The client is king. I really see it that way. No matter how annoying he is, he's king. And the way I want to be seen is I want it to be very clear that he or she is king. Yes. And by doing that, I already have an advantage because, and I'm not saying that I'm 
a servitude and that I bow or anything. I don't do that at all. I think anyone who hears my voice knows that that's not me. But it's it's that old fashioned saying, okay, you have a problem. I'm the one that's going to solve your problem. So I have the solution. You have the need. What can we do? And be really honest. So I have learned to really say what I can do and what I give as a bonus and what I cannot do. And yeah. I have learned to be so succinct in that, that it's become an art for me. That part of the communication is almost an art. Don't be vague. The vaguer you are, the less they're going to like you in a freelance job. Mm. And describe it in an addendum of the contract. So you have a contract with a, a job, a project, and then I have always created an addendum with the bullet points of what is really the task that I will perform. Yes. And so having that, having learned that skill, it has helped me tremendously because nobody gets disappointed. And nobody has to say, you know, when I say the contract is finished, blah, blah, blah. I always show the addendum. And I said, would you agree that I've done everything on there? And then they usually answer more than that. Thank you so much. And I get paid. Mm -hmm. And then you build a reputation. So with and Olivetti, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, Gabriella, no, no, with, with Olivetti, what was the main role? OK, it was a technology role, but what were you doing? I was um, they were working with me where I was being filmed. My hands and the screen was being filmed to teach people that work for Philips in Asian countries that, you know, it was the first kind of online course that wasn't online if you know what I mean. It was uh, like, let's say that Olivetti had the client Philips, they would go and teach Philips how to do something in a software like you're learning by yourself right now. Yes. But then they wanted me filmed, my hands and my screen were filmed, not me physically. Yes. Um, of what I did with my voice and then that cassette, that reel would go to Korea and they would show it there to the Philips executives. And then they oh. would learn that skill. Wow. And they chose me because they said that my voice um, is very deep. And then I said, so? And then they said, when you're recorded, a voice always becomes higher pitched. Mm. So we're looking for deep voices that then sound normal eh, on the recording. But if we have a high pitched voice, she's she or he is going to sound too high and people won't want to listen to that. And then they like that. I wasn't monotone, that I have a laugh and that even though I didn't have an audience, I could talk as if I see them. I'm very creative like that. And, and in what language were you doing this? English, French and Dutch. Wow. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. And and I loved it, you know, I, I, I just, I, I love languages, I love learning, and I love teaching, I guess. I didn't know that. Yes. I, I really do love teaching. I love giving them that tidbit that you search for for hours, and then I give it to you, and I just say, you know, in the videos, I just said, and I know you're smiling now because boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, the feedback was great because they said, yes, we saw your hands on the keyboard and the boom, boom, boom went with it and we got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, it was odd to me that I could do that because I love people so much. So it was odd to me not to be alone and to still be able to communicate Yes. Not having a human being in the room. Sure. And that made me realize that as a child, you play alone too, right? Mm. You, you play with your dolls and your Legos. And so to me, it was the same. I saw in my mind the people seeing my hands. And so, yeah, I made it fun, I guess.
Brilliant. Okay. Wow. Fast forward again. I did afterwards Microsoft, IBM. I became um, the guru, <laughs> the go-to for everything that was Microsoft. I started with DisplayWrite. It's a program that nobody knows, green letters on a black background. I worked for customs. I worked for other people and always freelancing yes. or temp agencies hired me, you know, and they knew my skill set. I would come, I would solve a project and move on. And then, you know, uh, Microsoft invented Windows. And there I went. And I would teach then in front of a classroom of, I would say, 50 to 100 people. And every group was put in a certain way. And it would have three screens, one in Dutch, one in French, one in English, with the software in three languages. And in hindsight, I didn't ask enough money. <laughs> because yeah. <laughs> I should have asked the money for three teachers or yes. at least two and I didn't do that yes but live and learn I was happy and that's all that matters <laughs> yeah that's right you know? it's an important point though because it's a mistake we all make in business is not mm -hmm. asking for enough money and it's not very often people turn around and go actually Gabriella you're not charging enough so we're going to double it. <laughs> no one does that. <laughs> uh, I had it happen, though. A Have Swedish, you? <laughs> uh, not a Dutch company would never do that. And, no. Uh, but I had a Swedish company offer me um, not double, but it was close. So I gave my price and they actually called me and said, sorry, Gabriella, but that's not enough. So we'll pay all your expenses and this amount. And they said, if we resend a better contract over, will you sign that? And I said, yes. Wow, that's amazing. I've only never heard. Only company that ever did that, Michael. Yeah, well, what a wonderful company. Mm -hmm. I, I think they were almost embarrassed at my price. But again, the reason for that is because I felt small because I didn't have an official diploma. Mm. I had, I have never realized until, you know, more, much more recently in the last 15 years that skill set is more important than any old dusty diploma that you can have. Oh, that is so true. That is so true. Yeah. yeah. And if we can encourage anyone that's listening, if you have a skill set that you have practiced for more than a year, you are the expert on that skill. Yeah. And we need to change mindsets. Please change it because you are an expert because you've spent so many hours, diligent hours learning it. Will you make a mistake? Of course you will. But you are the expert and that, and I, I don't know if you agree with me, Michael, um, this is something I had to learn from the Americans, the word expert. I would never have learned that word in Europe because they, they are kind of, um, too discreet, too polite to call yourself an expert in, in something, because I think for the Euro in any case, for what I know from Holland and France and Belgium and Germany, then you need to have done it 20 years. And that's not really true either. You have a really good skill set. You have excelled in it. You have had clients that are happy. You're an expert. Mm. And I think you can say that. Okay, that was the end of part one. And make sure you go and listen to part two. There are so many more nuggets in part two as well. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 